Hey everyone, Fear Crawler here. Welcome to the video. Mini Crawler and I were just scouring the internet looking for some stories, and we found a really delicious one about candy. That's right, candy. And what a delicious ride it's going to be. Hope you enjoy. The origins of Candy Crim are not distinct, but many say that the legend of Candy Crim dates back to the 1920s in the busy city of Chicago, where the streets bustled and everyone worked to earn their keep. Even boys at their young age would look for a job to either earn money for themselves or for their families, as was the case with Henry Fletcher, a young teenager who was the son of an Irish immigrant who had fallen ill and required his son to find a job to help support his family. He had a younger sister who had tragically died a year before his father had fallen ill and his mother was not able to go and help find work and money for the family. It was up to Henry to become the breadwinner for his family. This left Henry with little choice but to find a decent job that he enjoyed and to help bring in money for his family. One of his father's friends owned a candy shop and offered Henry a job if he was willing to work hard in both making and selling the candy. Henry eagerly agreed to take the job and began his training at the shop. He loved making candy and selling it, but more than that, he loved to share a joyful smile with anyone who would come to the shop and leave with their favorite sweets. Henry loved to spread joy, especially since he saw none when he returned home. Henry's mother was very distraught with the loss of her daughter and remained so long after her burial. However, as her husband grew ill, her sorrow turned to disdain. Her feelings further translated to an overall sense of loss and depression, which impacted her ability to provide in any way for her family. The responsibility of running the candy shop and helping his mother and father to heal both weighed heavily on his shoulders, but he greeted each day with a smile. Henry was never the type of person to let grief weigh down his life or his work. He pressed forward with his new job and continued to put forth his best effort each and every day at work. Many of the other boys in the neighborhood would come into the shop with their weekly work allowances or money they earned during the week and come to buy some of their favorite candy. Each day would pass as his parents' condition would grow worse, but he continued to go to work every day and take care of the shop and factory behind it, and would proceed home to take care of his family at night. He would administer medicine for his father when he returned home, and would keep his mother company and converse with her until she fell asleep. Then he would go fall asleep and begin the pattern again the following day. He continued this pattern for many weeks, making new candy in the back and selling it in the front. The shop would often close early so he could work on making more candy for the shop and work on new types of candy. He had begun working on his own concoction for a new kind of hard candy and he had nearly perfected the formula. It was a new kind of hard candy that he had wanted to shape into candy canes, but it had a distinct flavor of cinnamon and several other compelling ingredients. He had experimented with the mixture for many days until he finally had the right seasonings and chemical mixtures down to have perfected the recipe. In just two days time, he would have enough ready to begin selling at the shop. The shop owner had come by already after closing to taste the final recipe, and he found the candy to be delicious. He wanted more to be made, so a large vat of the candy would need to be made. The machines were set to begin making the candy throughout the following day, and as Henry came back to work the next morning, the rear end of the shop already smelled strongly of cinnamon and the other ingredients in his new candy. After securing the machines and making sure that the mixture would heat up slowly to a boiling hot temperature without burning, and making sure the mixture would continue to mix until the end of the work shift, Henry went to the front of the shop to begin opening it up for business. The day was fairly different, however, as there was a line that quickly formed around the shop today of young boys in the city who wanted to buy their fair share of candy. The shop was packed with boys and young men who wanted to purchase some candy from the shop and Henry did his best to meet each and every customer's request. After serving through about eight orders for candies, varying from chocolate to licorice, to varying types of hard candy, a young boy who was followed in by a man, who was assumed by all present to be his father, cut through the line and demanded to buy some candy. However, the young boy was very arrogant and greedy, and requested his father to purchase all of the candy in the store. I don't want any of these filthy street rats to have any precious candy, father. I want to buy all the candy and take it home. None of these filthy criminals deserve any. The other boys wanted to fight this newcomer, but Henry was quick to butt in on their behalf. Hey now, take it easy, fellas. No one should get rough in the shop. 
Keep it to the streets. As for you, kid, I'm afraid I can't sell you all the candy in the shop. These other guys put in their hard time and effort to earn money for this candy, and it's not fair to them if they can't buy any. The boy grew infuriated at Henry's responses. Father, he won't let me buy all the candy. Do something, father. The father looked down at his son, then turned to address Henry, asking for the shop owner. My boy, if you could fetch me the shop owner, I would like to buy the shop from him. May I speak with him? Henry knew the shop owner was not present and would not arrive until later that day. I'm afraid not, sir. You see, the shop owner isn't here today and he won't be here later on. I'm afraid you won't be able to speak with him. The boy was in a furious rage now. Father, I hate you. You never get me what I want. I'm going home. The boy began to walk out of the shop with his father close behind him. All the while, the other boys were calling the rude, rich boy names and telling him to get out of the shop. The young boy screamed through the window at Henry. You'll pay for this indignity. All the other boys cheered and congratulated Henry on his minor victory over the rude, rich men who had attempted to take the shop he had worked so hard for. He went back to work, selling more and more candy until the line was completely empty. The shop was empty around four in the afternoon, and Henry decided since no one was heading into the shop that he would head to the back and check on the progress of his new candy in the large mixing vat, hoping that the mixture was ready. He did not hear the sound of the shop bell sounding off, or the footsteps of the young rich boy he had dismissed earlier sneaking in. Henry had climbed up the stairs to go and look from atop the large mixing vat that was slowly churning the boiling hot mixture of candy that would soon make his new cinnamon candy canes. He did not notice the young boy sneak up the stairs to approach him. Henry finally heard footsteps right behind him as he rose his head up and looking down from the hot candy mix and shutting off the rotating mixing arm. He turned around to face the boy that he had denied earlier only to be pushed across the railing by the young boy into the vat of boiling hot candy. Henry's flesh began to melt and bubble inside the boiling candy mix. The young boy was laughing at Henry from the guardrail above. That's what happens to people who don't give me what I want. Henry closed his eyes as he sank further and further into the deep vat of candy. The heater had stopped along with the mixing arm, but the candy mix was still boiling and burning away at Henry's body, completely submerging him in a sugary magma. He scraped at the sides, desperately trying to claw his way out of the mixing vat, but he was trapped inside of it, slowly dying inside the candy mixture as it began to cool off. He began to rock and hit the sides of the vat of candy, desperately trying to knock it over and let him free. And after several attempts, he succeeded in knocking the vat over onto the floor. He slid out of the vat of candy, completely covered in a hardened candy exterior. Henry's new exterior frightened him, and he desperately tried to rip off or break his candy exterior, but it was no use. He took a nearby hammer from a bench and began to pound his left arm, desperately hoping for the hardening candy to break. But after several hard swings, it was no use. Henry then took his arm into his mouth and began to try to bite on it slowly licking off parts of the candy exterior, only to watch it reform quickly before his very eyes. He walked towards a mirror in the back of the shop to gain a closer look at his body. What he found shocked him and filled him with terror. His entire body had been covered with the new candy that he'd been working so hard on making, and his body had been forever altered. Head to toe, he was covered in repeating red and pink candy stripes that ran down his entire body. His teeth had turned a deep shade of yellow, and his hair had changed to being a candy-like strand, almost like licorice. Henry ripped off a piece and bit into it, tasting the familiar taste of licorice, and watched the hair quickly reform back at the base of his head and regrow to its original length. But what startled Henry most about his new appearance were his sharp green eyes that glistened like bright emeralds. His new exterior frightened him, and he began to sob only to find the tears forming sugar water and upsetting him even more. His body finally ceased feeling burning sensations and pain, and Henry grew very angry. He wanted to take revenge against the boy who had did this and the parents who had raised the boy. Henry's growing rage turned into an insane thirst for blood, 
as he began to take the candy mix he fell in and form large candy canes with an edge that extended along the length of the candy cane. As the candy cooled, he began to work on other candy weapons to take with him. He made a powder that would both blind, candy drops that were so sweet that they could convince someone to do almost anything, candy bombs, and a sour soda he created that was so acidic, the container he began to make the soda in began to break down. This soda pop will first be very sour, then in the end, very, very sweet. He put all these things in rings on a belt around his spare set of clothes, and began to place several small lollipops in his pocket to keep track of who he hurt, and took out the candy blade he had worked hard on to create. He sharpened the candy blade's edge, and stamped on an engraving in candy on the side of the blade with the word Exodus spelled out on the side. The blade was created to eliminate any threats, and any memories best left forgotten. He tested the blade on the hairs of the shop room they kept around for cleaning, and watched the hairs easily split along the edge of Exodus. Henry then tested the strength of the blade by slamming it against the large rocks that were outside of the shop, shattering each of them easily. Satisfied with his new weapons, Henry was ready to take revenge on the boy who had left him trapped in the candied prison that was his new body. He snuck down the back alleyway after closing the shop and quickly cleaning the floor of any leftover candy, and making some backup candy cane blades if they proved to be necessary. He snuck out through the back and made his way across the city, keeping to the shadows the best that he could. He did not want any passerby to notice him as he hunted down the home of the boy. Henry approached along an empty alleyway that was fairly close to the boy's mansion, and found him in an alley with a bodyguard, as the bodyguard was beating up another boy on the request of the rich brat who pushed Henry into the candy vat. Henry grinned as he made his slow approach behind them. Henry spoke up and surprised both the rich boy and his bodyguard. Did you miss me? As the bodyguard turned to face Henry, he threw an irritating candy powder into the bodyguard's face, causing his entire face to swell, and for him to instantly go blind in searing pain. The bodyguard fell to the ground, and the other boy ran off in fear of what might happen next. The rich boy was frozen with fear at the appearance of Henry. Who? Oh, who are you? The boy was trembling with fear as he looked into the deep green eyes of Henry. Henry knelt down and looked straight into the eyes of the boy. I was the guy who worked down at the candy store before you pushed me into a boiling hot vat of candy mix. You tried to kill me, but I survived. The kid stared in fear at the eyes of Henry. Are you some kind of candy cream man or something? You hurt my bodyguard, candy cream man. And I'm not going to let you take away my fun. Henry laid a direct blow to the face of the boy with the blunt end of Exodus, sending him flying against the wall and falling to his knees. You won't hurt me. Bodyguard, help me. The bodyguard got back up and tried to maneuver towards Henry, but remained blinded by the candy powder. Henry took Exodus and drove it directly into the man's chest. Henry drove him to the ground and began to stab him. Stab after stab after stab, until the bodyguard was nothing more than a bloodbath along the alleyway. Henry then placed a lollipop inside the mouth of the man to signify his recognized death. The boy, now filled with fear, reached for a nearby blade and struck it hard against Henry's leg, hoping to strike pain in him. But after watching the blade simply fall out of the boy's hand, he watched as the small scratch he made against Henry's candied flesh quickly covered itself over again. You can't hurt me. No one can hurt me. The boy desperately tried to intimidate and scare Henry away, but it was too late. Oh, why are you so sour? After I'm done with you, you are going to be very, very sweet. Henry pulled out the bottle of soda pop he had worked on and began to forcibly pour some down the boy's throat. He watched and giggled with glee as the boy's lips began to pucker, and his eyes began to form tears in pain and fear for what was happening to him. 
the boy's body began to spasm. And after 30 seconds had passed, after taking just a few sips from Henry's soda, the boy's face began to turn into a sickening grin, his body being overwhelmed with the sweetness and the feelings of euphoria that rushed through his disintegrating body as the soda ate away at all of his internal organs. Henry began to carry away the boy's body out of the alleyway, back to the shop, and began to disassemble the boy on a work table, slowly draining the blood out of the boy's body. Henry chopped the boy's body up into tiny pieces and began to burn them inside of an oven. He then took the blood and began to mix it in a large pot with sugar and other flavorings, slowly boiling the blood and sugar into a dark red hard candy. As Henry mixed the candy, he began to debate what the boy had called him. Huh. <sighs> candy cream man. What a stupid thing to call somebody. Candied cream? No. Candied Krim. That name actually sounds great. Krim made sure to save the ring finger of the boy, with the family ring and family crest clearly visible on the finger. He placed both the finger and the candy into a box and sealed the package together. Krim made his way to the mansion, sneaking past the gate and past the guards to the front porch, and left the box at the door. Krim then knocked on the door, and crept along the side of the house to a nearby window into one of the bathrooms. He crept into the kitchen as the boy's mother and father approached the door to find their package. Their fear and terror. Terror so strong that the mother who opened the box had dropped it to the ground. They saw the ring finger of their now deceased son. The father called out to the guards in the yard and told them to head into the city and find their son's murderer. The father tried to console his wife. We'll find him, honey. I'm sure we'll find the man who killed our son. Krim then emerged from his hiding position and announced his presence. No need to search, because I am already here. Both of the parents jumped back in fear of Candy Krim's appearance. The mother spoke with a trembling voice. Why, why did you kill our son? Krim's voice grew intense, and the hints of insanity in his voice were very evident to both of the parents. Oh, after what your boy did to me? Leaving me with my new body after tossing me into boiling candy and leaving me to die? I just had to repay the favor. It was too sweet to resist. Both the husband and wife tried to call out to the guards to help, but a ball filled with smoke had rolled to their feet and was activated. Krim then rushed in at full speed, tackling both of them to the ground and delivering heavy stabs with exodus into each of their chests. He stabbed the couple, laughing maniacally as he did so. And after the couple's blood drenched the floor, Krim decided his work was done and placed a lollipop into each of their mouths. The guards ran back to the mansion after hearing all the screams of terror, but Krim was never found. He escaped off into the distance, away from Chicago, leaving his family and everyone else behind. Candied Krim roamed the country, never finding sanctuary or a place to settle down and call home. Many rumors and tales of his appearance, or more murderers have been recorded, but no letters, statements, or photos of Candied Krim were ever found. With his body forever encased in candy, he is believed to be alive to this very day, roaming the countryside looking for more lives to claim and more smiles to make. After all, Candied Krim wanted to live his life making others and himself happy, and the journey he was on after that night was just too sweet for him to resist. Aw oh, man, that story was so long! But we still have to read part two yet. No way! I'm out of here. But good raccoons get chocolates. You have my attention. Enjoy part two. Oh, it's so beautiful. The wonderful rides as they spin around. 
bright colors popping from every corner, the beautiful music that's pouring into my ears. All of these beautiful sensations are just flooding into my mind. How I've dreamed that this day would arrive. After years of mistreatment by mother, I finally have my wish. It was all thanks to my friend Krim, and the plan was so simple. Mother was always so terrible around the house. While father was off on business trips, she would invite other men into our home to perform strange acts with them. I hated how distant she had become with me and father. He sent us a telegram before asking how mother and I were, but she lied to him and said that everything was fine. Our servant Alfonso did his best to cheer me up, but mother would drown herself in drink to succumb to her sorrow. Her sorrow would often turn into fits of rage, and she would unleash her rage upon our home and upon me. Alfonso always stood there as a friend to me and protected me from her at times, always there to clean up the mess she made after she had fallen back into sorrow. Alfonso was a good friend, but not the one I needed. I needed a friend who would be able to show me fun and help me find the joys in life. That's when one day I met my wonderful friend Candy Krim. Mother had thrown another fit of rage earlier in the day and was alone in her bedroom. I sat outside in our large garden, and I noticed a candy-colored boy walking by my home in the nearby fields. I called him over to see if he'd like to talk to me. Hey, you there. Can I talk to you? The figure lifted up its head and looked over towards me. This boy was the strangest one I had ever seen in my entire life. His entire body was covered in some striped red and pink colors almost like his entire body was made of candy, including parts of his clothing. But what stood out to me besides just his candy body was his piercing green eyes. They shone bright like the most beautiful emeralds that my father brought home as a gift to my mother once. He looked like he had been walking for a while, so I called Alfonso to the garden so he would hopefully bring this boy some water. But Alfonso never arrived, so I went inside. I went to the cupboard to fetch this boy a glass of water. I went back outside to the water faucet to begin pouring the glass, and out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the boy in the garden, smelling the roses and orchids in my mother's garden, taking in deep breaths and truly smelling their fragrance. I came over to him with a glass of water in my hand. He was much larger than me and somewhat felt a bit threatening, holding more authority than my mother ever cared to offer me. Here's some water to quench your thirst. His voice spoke with a sickening sweetness, almost forcibly sweet. Thank you. He happily sat down on the ground and began to drink the large glass of water. He drank with a force that would make any other person who watched him feel thirsty as well. Is there any more? I nodded yes and took the glass back as he handed it to me so that I could go refill it once more at the fountain. He followed me to the drinking fountain and watched as I pulled the lever and pumped out some more water. I quickly pumped to have it out as quickly as possible. I handed the glass back to him and watched him drink the entire glass again. But he showed a slight bit more restraint this time. I appreciate your kindness. He then showed me a grin of gratitude that both seemed pleasant and sent a large chill down my spine as I saw the most wicked and unnerving teeth I had ever seen. His teeth were abnormally perfect. He spoke to me again with his sweet voice. You are alone out here? But why? A boy like you must have friends. I lowered my head in disappointment. I am afraid not. Mother does not permit me to have any friends, and Alfonso cannot help me find any to play with. Krim knelt down next to me and locked his bright green eyes in a gaze with mine. Would you like for me to be your friend? My name is Krim. Candied Krim. I could not believe any of what had just occurred. I had finally made a friend, and a very special friend at that. One who I could look up to and almost call a brother. Krim would come and visit me in the garden from day to day. Our routine was simple, but one that was very important to both of us. Both Krim and I would meet at 3 o'clock sharp in the garden. I would prepare him some water and we would both sit in the garden and play games. Krim would also share his candy with me every day. 
his sweet and wonderful hard candy that he would keep in a small satchel in his pocket. His candy was unlike anything I'd ever tasted, and every time I had a piece, I craved for more. So we made it a routine for us to meet every day and for us to share the way that we did, almost like true brothers. One day, Krim asked me if we could go to the carnival, but I knew my mother wouldn't allow me to go on my own, and she had no knowledge of my new friend. Your mother will not let you go? But it is a wonderful place, full of candy, laughter, and fun beyond your wildest dreams. My mother will not allow me to go, and she'll be very cross when she learns about you. Then I'll wait for nightfall for both of us to go, and you can show me your mother. I believe she will understand. We waited until nightfall came and dusk had nearly passed to ask my mother. My mother was in another one of her fits. I went to ask my mother, but was met with horrible surprise. I went to my mother's room and came face to face with her lying next to another man. She was enraged by my presence. Hans, leave this room now. But before I could make quick enough haste, she chased me down and kicked me in the side and sent me flying against the wall. Her lover came running as well and began to beat me. Rotten kid. Bastard needs to be taught a lesson. He stood up above me with his foot raised, ready to land a final blow. But that was when Krim showed his true and beautiful colors. Krim rushed in with his large candy blade Exodus, engraved with its name in a deep crimson red, and toppled Mother's lover to the floor, covering him in blood. Krim looked to me for a response. I can end this. All I need is your word, Hans. I looked at my mother, seething with rage and hatred. No love emanated from her eyes, no remorse. She was a cold, heartless being with no love or care for anyone. She wanted me to die more than anything her lover could provide her, and that fear drove me to make my decision. End it. Krim threw out a puff of candy powder from his hand and blinded mother. As he went back to work on her lover, who was beginning to stand on his feet, Krim unleashed slash after slash, painful cut after painful cut against the man's center mass until he toppled over. Then Krim kneeled over the man and began to drive Exodus deep into the man's chest and began to hack away at the man's bleeding chest until his heart was exposed. Krim removed the still beating heart, blood pulsing quickly out of the tough muscle, and he threw it at mother's blinded face, sending her stumbling backward and falling to the floor. Krim then removed a lollipop from his pocket and placed it in the man's mouth, and then turned his focus onto mother. Krim took a special bottle out of his other pocket and began to pour some of it down mother's throat. Here is some of Candy Krim's special sour brew of candy pop. Mother began to convulse and shudder in pain from Krim's delicious drink, and her breaths began to grow weak. As her final breaths grew near, Krim ran out to deal with Alfonso and began to dispatch him like the man who was found with Mother. I could hear the screams and cries for help from Alfonso as his bones cracked from Krim's onslaught. I moved closer to Mother and looked into her dying gaze. Her final breath was painful to hear, but one that reminded me of why she deserved her fate. I always wanted to die, ever since you were first born. Mother then closed her eyes and grew stone cold as the footsteps of Krim began to emerge from down the hall, as he carried Alfonso's head with a lollipop in Alfonso's mouth. In Krim's other hand, he carried another lollipop that he quintessentially placed in Mother's mouth as well, and exclaimed with joy as he had completed his work. Ah, at last. You are free to enjoy life with me, Hans. Together. I smiled as Krim and I went to go and cleanse Krim of the blood from his body, and began our venture towards the carnival. We arrived as the lights had just begun to show at their brightest, illuminating the night sky. 
We began to run to the entrance and quickly ran inside past the gate and started to run through all the stands, screaming like wild children overjoyed to finally be at the carnival. Krim and I first went to go and grab some cotton candy and enjoy our sweet taste of freedom. Our next venture was to go and play at one of the stands. The stand I wanted to play at was the ball tossing stand, but the owner of the stand blocked every throw that Krim tried to throw at the bottles, desperately trying to knock them over. We were eventually told to leave the stand as Krim was told that he was not welcomed by the stand holder. After a bit of retreat from the ball throwing stand, we made our way to our next venture, the apple bobbing contest. Both Krim and I entered the contest and did our best to bob for apples. I could only get two in my mouth while Krim held an impossibly high number of five, having all fit at once inside his outstretched mouth. Krim had truly won the contest, but he was disqualified by the contest host and was told he was not allowed to compete. Disheartened, our final venture was to ride the Ferris wheel which Krim told me would be the most fun I would ever have at a carnival. From atop the Ferris wheel, you can see all the world around you for miles in any direction. I was overwhelmed with excitement to ride the Ferris wheel and hoped to be able to participate in this venture. But we were both denied at the gate by the carnival owner. You two freaks are not allowed here. You need to leave. Two of the carnies who stood by him threw me out of line and pointed towards the exit. I began to walk away crying. All I wanted was to have fun and taste freedom for once in my life, but I was being denied time and time again. The world truly hated me, and I hated it. Krim saw the tears that streaked across my saddened face. I hate to see you sad, Hans. His voice turned from one of sweetness to a heated anger one that wanted to strike vengeance against the carnies. I can make it all better. All you have to do is tell me to do it. My pain was cured before by Krim, and after him freeing me once from my torment, I would no longer deny his efforts to help. Do it. Candied Krim went to work once again and began to stab and throw candy bombs at carnies and rude people alike. Head to the ferris wheel and get on, Hans. You'll be able to watch everything from up there. I ran through the gate as Krim brutally stabbed the carnival owner in the neck with Exodus and began to make short work of the carnies. I got in a cart on the ferris wheel and began to watch the carnival as I ascended into the air. From above, I could watch Krim begin to turn the once slightly dim carnival into a beautiful crimson wonderland. The music could be heard from down below and drowned out some of the horrifying screams of the carnival staff and people running in fear. From up atop, I could see the beautiful crimson red scene laid out before me. Some people were burned alive, others were slashed open and others were poisoned by Krim's lovely treats. As I made my way down, my eyes grew locked with his. His gaze towards mine was one that was more animalistic than human, and his wicked grin across his face showed his true nature. Exodus was dragging along the metal railing of the ferris wheel as he made his way towards me, his beautiful bloodlust finally seeming to have been fulfilled. May I join you for a ride, Hans? He extended his blood-drenched hand towards me as if a friendly gesture for me to pull him up inside the cart. I did so, and he took the seat across from mine. We made our way up above the carnival, and Krim let out a sigh of relief. Take a look at the beautiful carnival, Hans. The scenery below is simply to die for. After mentioning the scenery, Krim began to wipe Exodus off with a handkerchief. And after wiping it off, he pulled a lollipop out of his pocket. His sickening smile and maddening eyes glared into my very soul. Do you want to have one last bit of fun, Hans? I looked nervously at the blade, but I have too much trust in him. 
he had already given me the taste of freedom, sweetness, and friendship. Anything that was to happen to me now was all worth it. Krim gave me more than nearly anyone ever did in my entire life, and he offered me gifts that I would never forget. In the end, I never regretted anything that Krim did, or what happened next. After all, it was all too sweet to resist. Well, that's all for today's video. Mini Carl and I hope that you enjoy it. Did you eat that whole bag of chocolate? Chocolate? Like milk chocolate?